Okay, so I wanna welcome everyone to week 21 of the X Essentials presentation. Uh, this week, we have an exciting topic, a lot of interest. Hopefully everybody saw the uh, promo video. Uh, the topic is projector mapping, and Gordon Nash will be presenting. Um, once again, I wanna remind everybody to please not have their cameras on and to stay muted for the presentation. At the end, uh, Jordan will be addressing any questions you also feel free to ask anything in chat, and I'm sure people will respond and comment. Um, Jordan, you've got the floor. Wonderful, thanks, Ed. Hey, I'm Jordan Nash. I'm so excited to, to present this, uh, I guess almost a whirlwind kind of overview on projector mapping. And we're gonna go over projector mapping and creating content. I'm gonna actually map a house, actually a dollhouse uh, that I got off Craigslist. Um, while I introduce you myself, I want to take a look at what I did last year on my house. And some of you have seen this. I set up two projectors in my yard and I just did some fun stuff just for Halloween time while it was still kind of warm. I'm from uh, Utah, so I can't do it this during, during the Christmas season, just it's not practical. It's too cold out and the snow and, and whatnot. Uh, I happened to move into a white brick house about three years ago and I just had the random idea, hey, I should project on this thing. Um, so I got a few projectors for my work and made this map and then spent the year making content for it. And the show was, oh, 10, yeah, maybe just over 10 minutes and the kids would come get their candy, watch the show and then leave. Uh, last year, I've been doing projection for three years. Last year was my first year doing uh, X lights. You can see the lights there briefly around the outlines of the windows. Uh, so yeah, I've only done Christmas lighting for, for a year now, so I'm fairly new to that. As far as my background, I have a background in film, video, live broadcasting, corporate audiovisual. Basically, I love taking technology and engineering it and creating it, making it, uh, creating it into something awesome, something that the audience can, can really enjoy. I really love the fusion between technology and engineering and creativity and bringing those all together into a really cool product. Uh, this is done in just a second. We'll go on. Great, some of the things that we're gonna talk about today in the next hour, hour and 20 minutes, maybe hour and 30 if we stretch it, uh, we're gonna cover what is projector mapping, how to create a map, and we're gonna do, again, a live demo of, of how to create that. We're gonna talk about animation techniques, and we'll make some animations, and gathering content. Uh, this is, again, a super a topic that I'm super excited about. I love doing this, and I love using technology to create a really immersive display. I hope to make this as cohesive as possible. Basically, I have a week's worth of class content to cover and I have about an hour to cover it, which is gonna be quite a challenge. Uh, I'm guaranteed, because of that, I'm guaranteed to skip over a bunch of stuff, uh, especially when I get into the software, the software that I'm gonna be using, uh, many of you have probably never used before. Um, so I'm gonna be moving quite quickly and uh, again, there's going to be questions all over the place, and I apologize for moving so quickly and, uh, and uh, skipping over things. Um, I'm not watching the chat, so if somebody has a, a per pertinent question, you know, feel free to, to uh, unmute yourself and let me know. Um, I hope to, yeah, just get through stuff as quickly as possible. I will open it up for questions at the very end. I know you're going to have questions throughout. Uh, but if you can wait until the end, that'd be awesome, and we'll uh, spend some time answering those. What else? Uh, while I'm going through this, uh, you may or may not be able to uh, invest in the software that I'm using. If you don't, I want you to try and think about how some of these method uh, about some of these methods, and how can how you can apply them to your display. Um, yeah, let's move on. What is projector mapping? Um, to answer that, I'm going to have my friends at Prendy uh, answer that question. And immediately following that, I'm going to play just about a minute of cool samples that I found. And some of these that some of these you may have seen, um, just just samples. These, I mean these these houses and these these architectural buildings, these displays are amazing. And these people have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours creating these. So I just thought I'd show you what like a legitimate professional mapping 
uh, is like. Projection mapping is the art of using projectors to map light onto any surface, turning common 3D objects into interactive displays. We then use motion graphics and creative coding to display highly engaging or immersive content, essentially replacing the surface of the object. So to kind of reiterate what was said, projector mapping isn't just shooting a projector at a surface, it's actually going in and tracing the surface and using the geometry and the architecture to your advantage and project, projecting very specific shapes and objects onto that surface. Um, as far as a basic setup, there's three parts. There's your source, your projector, and your surface. And I want to touch briefly on all three of those. Uh, types of sources. Uh, from the simplest, it can be Falcon Pi Player or X Schedule running off a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it can be run off a laptop using Windows Media Player, QuickTime, iTunes, etc. Or you can get something really, really advanced. And I just put this uh, category in here because most of those examples that we just saw use a large scale media server like Disguise, Hippo, Archaos, Watch Out. Uh, these are very, very professional software. And the cool thing about these, they're, they're a little bit different because uh, unlike what we're going to do today in making all the content and the masking uh, in software and rendering it out as a pre-made video, these media servers here on the right side can actually take that content and mask it and shape it and project it live. And they can do all that rendering live, which is really, really cool. Uh, and they're very useful for very large scale surfaces. Types of projectors. I know that somebody out there is going to ask, well, what kind of projector should I buy? Well, I don't know if I can actually give you a, a great recommendation. I can tell you the things to look for, uh, but the actual specific model, I, you know, anywhere in there. I have a few links at the end of my presentation of uh, places to look. Things you want to look for is your brightness, which is measured in lumens. The higher the lumens, the better. Inputs, uh, if you veer towards digital inputs, that's better, like DVI or HDMI. Your resolution, uh, there's tons of different resolutions out there. The higher resolution it is, the bigger the content you have to make for it, but the prettier it looks on your house. My projection that I did on my house was two 1080p projectors. Uh, the projector that I'll be doing the demo on is 1024 by 768, which is significantly smaller than that. But for my purposes, and I got the projector for free, it works great. Lumen recommendation, I would recommend at least a 3000 lumen. Um, anywhere between 3000 and 5000 should be plenty enough for most houses. Uh, the next thing to look for is uh, your contrast ratio. The higher the contrast ratio, the better. A 50,000 to one contrast ratio is better than 5000 to one. What contrast ratio means is it's the amount of gradations between black and white. If you only have five uh, 5,000 levels, that's only 5,000 individual colors or gradations between those two. So 5000 has much better contrast in the lights versus the, dar the darks. I hope that that made sense. Next thing to look for is image warping, um, the ability to change front versus rear projection, any kind of keystoning that it has. More advanced projectors will have a corner correction, which you can actually take each of the four corners and warp them in, which is very handy, especially if you're stri striking your projector at night. And then very advanced projectors will have advanced uh, point warping, which you can project onto curved surfaces and things like that. You also want to look at your, at your lens. Uh, most projectors have some kind of a lens calculator, so you can make sure that your lens is wide enough to actually hit the entire width of your, of your surface. 
And then of course the cost, you get more features and mm -hmm. um, yes, you get more features. Okay, types of projectors. We have from the low end to the medium to the high. Uh, the projector I'm using for this demo is uh, about the second one there. The one that I used on my house that I got from my company last year was about halfway in between the, the third and the fourth. And it seems to be that the cheaper projectors have less features and more expensive have more features and they're also much brighter. The one pictured on the far right side there is 30,000 lumens and costs about $100,000 without a lens, and the lens is another 20 grand. Good luck affording that. Here's a bunch of recommendations, links to uh, places that you can go that just have random recommendations and a uh, buyer's guide. The one on the bottom there uh, is actually from 2018, and it has just the latest and greatest um, two projectors. And I will, of course, post all of these links in the YouTube description when we post the final video. Next is surfaces. There's many different kinds of surfaces and I'm gonna show you a few examples. One is just your entire house. I'm sure that most of us have seen this video. And this, we're actually fooling the eye and we're using a little bit of 3D. Um, the, the interesting thing about that is if you look at it from a different angle, it just looks completely skewwampus. I found a video from a different angle and just nothing lines up and it looks really funny. Next is a garage door. Here's just some fun stuff you can do with a basic garage door. He obviously the, um, went in and, and traced out that garage door and did some fun projection on it. Here's a quick video of, of him, her, uh, doing the live warping on his or her house. And again, we'll see a live demo on this in just a minute. Uh, next is just ordinary objects. Uh, anything with a lighter color. Here is a Santa. You could project onto a Santa. I've seen shoes. I've seen lots of fun stuff. Uh, here's the Atmos 3D effects form. And I'm sure that some of you have probably seen this before. Is it projector mapping? Kind of. You're, you're warping a projector onto a surface, but are you really tracing it out? Not really. So I guess we could qualify it as, as mapping and I'll put some links uh, at the end of the presentation about uh, Atmos and where to find that. Here's a little demo of their form. It's just an inflatable form that you put a sheet over and you project onto it. Next is a car, because why not? This is very nice content, very beautiful 3D content that's 3D projected onto a car. And lastly, there's pumpkins. This guy actually lives down the street from me and makes singing pumpkin videos that you can project onto pumpkins. Uh, so I use some of his stuff in my Halloween show. Okay, let's talk about the setup. Uh, these are the main parts of, of the setup that I'm gonna be doing. I have my laptop driving the content. I come out uh, to a USB C into HDMI, I have a HDMI to DVI converter because my projector does not take HDMI, I have to convert to DVI. I, plugged in, I plug into my projector and then I project onto this little dollhouse that I found for super cheap on Craigslist. Now when you're making the map, it might be a good idea to bring a video camera and a screen with you so you don't have to keep, uh, you, somehow you need to magnify the image so you can see it really, really up close so you can get it pretty pixel accurate. Um, when I did it, yeah, I brought the camera and the, and a screen out and I set it right next to my laptop so I could zoom in on my house with the camera and I didn't have to strain my eyes or get binoculars or get up out of my chair and run up to the house and say, okay, two pixels to the left, one pixel up. Anyway, some kind of magnification is a really good idea. Alrighty, the next thing I want to do is transition to a demo. Uh, this part is pre-recorded and there's a number of reasons that I did that. The first one mainly being is that I can do a split screen and I feel like I can cover a lot more content a lot quicker. Um, so you'll see me, you'll see a live capture of my screen doing audio editing, doing the, the content gathering, the content creation. And then you'll also see a camera that's pointed at my dollhouse. Alrighty, let's get started. Before we do anything, I have to get on a soapbox 
for a minute about organizing files. Uh, especially with content creation, your files just seem to multiply and you'll get tons and tons and tons of them. So uh, let's go ahead and make a new folder. I'm going to do it right on the desktop. You can put it where you like. Uh, my naming convention, I do a two digit year, 18, and then I do a month. Right now it's June. So I'm going to do 1806. And that's just my naming convention. You can use whatever you like. Projector mapping. Um, this really helps me find files very, very quickly. I have the year and the month. Let's look in my video projects folder. You notice here on the left side, uh, I have the year and the month of every project. And as soon as I'm done with a project, I go and put it on a hard drive, take it off my local hard drive, put it on an external drive, and it can sit there and rot until I need files from it again. I'm going to make a few folders in here. One is called sound that I can put all of my sound, sound effects, music, whatever. I'm going to make a project files folder. Inside this folder, I'm going to place my Premiere files and my After Effects files. Let's also make a folder called Images, Video, and Renders. And there we go. There's one thing that you can take away from this entire presentation. I want it to be, please keep your files organized. Every time that you download something, put it in a folder. If you get more than three or four of a similar file, make a folder for it. It really helps you in the long run. End of soapbox. Similar to what a cinematographer would do in terms of photography and the images, a sound designer's job is to create the same environment you see with your eyes, but with your ears. For my music selection, I wanted to find something that's very fun, very upbeat, and has lots of little sound effects and doodads and bleeps and bloops. Uh, that I can do fun animations too. Note that you can find your music now and layer on more sound effects later. So I like to start looking in YouTube. Techno, remix, or sometimes even dubstep are really good places to start. So let's look up Halloween Remix. After listening to a bunch of these, this is one that I really like. Let's take a listen. Conveniently in the description, there's a link to iTunes. So I can easily download the MP3. Let's grab my audio file and drop it into my sound folder. Before we dive into editing and content creation, I wanted to talk about the software that I use. I use the Adobe Creative Cloud and that includes software like Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere, After Effects, Audition, all of these wonderful, wonderful, fantastic, very professional uh, pieces of software. Is this software a bit of a learning curve? Yes. However, there is tons of free and paid tutorials all over the place. Is the software free? No. Is there other software out there? Yes. Is it less expensive or possibly free? Yes. Is it the best bang for your buck? I don't think so. Yes, you can do this whole thing in paint or other not as great software Will you get the same result. I really don't think so. Before I started all of this, Ed and I had a conversation about whether I should demo everything using free or very, very cheap software. And we both decided that it wasn't the way to go. Mainly because if you're going to do something, why not use the best tools available? Also, I've been using After Effects and I use it almost every day. Uh, so creating content in it is quite straightforward. If you are serious about adding this kind of video, a very immersive uh, element to your, to your show, I'd highly recommend looking into a license. You can just go to adobe.com and click on view all products. Scroll down, and here under After Effects, you can click Download Trial. I can also click Buy Now, and we have a single app or the entire creative suite, which is uh, all the softwares that I mentioned just a second ago, and tons and tons more. For the single app, uh, you can get either the trial, or I can get just a, a single month subscription, which is just above 30 US dollars which for all the content and the really cool element that this is going to be adding to your show, 
I think it's totally worth the $31 for a month uh, to, to purchase this software and, and make your content and map your house out. So let's jump into Premiere and edit this audio file down a bit. Open Premiere and hit New Project. I'm going to now save this back in my project files on my desktop. And I'm going to title the project 1806 Projector Mapping Audio. Hit Enter and that'll bring up Premiere. Just a quick overview of how this works. Here's your media and your library. This is a preview window, a program window, and your timeline below. Double click in your project window and navigate to your sound file. Click import and drag that down to the new timeline icon. That then creates me a timeline. Let's zoom in by hitting shift plus and I can easily zoom in and out of the timeline just hitting the plus and minus keys. And now let's trim this down. We're at about five and a half minutes and I want it to be, oh, maybe just under a minute. All right, let's jump in and cut some of this down. I'm going to stop it right on the downbeat there. Zoom in using the plus and minus keys. And right here I'm going to, I'm going to do a cut. I can either grab my razor, my razor tool and cut it or I can just hit Command K and that will also cut. Right there. Again on the downbeat, I'm going to cut it again. Delete this, delete that. And let's take a listen. I think that sounds great. And I'll fast forward the next little bit of this, just cutting down the music. Okay, so we have this chopped down. I'm at about 50 seconds, which is right where I want it, at least for this demo. One more thing that I want to do is go in and add markers. When I render this out as a WAV file, those markers will stay intact in the in the audio file and that'll help me a ton in After Effects uh, know where to do the timings. So I'm going to go through and whenever I hear a big downbeat or something I'm going to hit M on my keyboard and that will add a marker in. Okay, when all my markers are placed, we come up to File Export, Media, and let's set it as a waveform audio. And I'm going to output it again in my folder, in the sound subfolder. And let's name it Edited, hit Save, and Export. Alright, I intentionally didn't spend a lot of time on that just because it's kind of outside of the uh, the realm of, of what we're going over today. Um, in my folder, you can see in the sound I have my edited file, which is a WAV file. Uh, I'm going to take a listen to that and make sure it all sounds good. Awesome, it sounds great. I'm going to go ahead and save my Premiere file and quit. Before we go and create the map of your surface, it's time to actually set up your projector. It's probably helpful to do this at nighttime so you can see the image. Set it up in a place that has low traffic so it won't get bumped. It helps to shoot your projector image slightly wider than your surface. Try to use minimal warping and keystoning as this reduces resolution. Unless you're Chuck Norris and can set up, map, create content, and do a show all in the same day, you'll probably need to bring your projector in for the night. It's a good idea to mark the exact location with spray paint or lawn markers. Me, I used a few rocks. To sidetrack for just a sec, projector enclosures are a great idea if you're planning on having your projector out more than one or two days, say for the Christmas season. There's tons of great ideas for enclosures out there. Do a search on the Facebook page or the forums. 
and you can find lots of other people that have created enclosures that work really well for them. All in all, make sure that your projector is well ventilated. You can even go as far as to automatically turn your projector on and off at certain times using Falcon Pi Player or X Schedule. I won't get into that, but there's a few examples on the Facebook page and forums. Feel free to ask around. When creating your map, it might be a good idea to bring a small table and a chair out, and possibly a small space heater, as it could take a little while to create the map. It took me three days. I also traced every one of 500 bricks. The next thing to do is to plug your projector into your computer using an HDMI, DVI, or whatever your projector and computer have. For this demo, I use a USB-C to HDMI dongle, then I adapt to DVI, and then into the projector. The next thing to do is to find your projector's native resolution. If you don't know this, you can find out on Google by using your projector's model number. Many projectors say they can support up to a higher resolution, but their native resolution is actually much smaller. What this means is that you can send a higher resolution video signal, but the projector will actually downscale, and I just think that that's silly. The higher the resolution you make your content in, the harder it is to find the content and create content, and also the longer it takes to render. Now that your projector's all hooked up and focused, and you know the native resolution, it's time to set up the projector in the display settings on your computer. This is on a Mac. I'm gonna to go to the Apple System Preferences, click on Displays. If I hit Arrangement, it shows that I have my projector connected because I have two displays here. And I'm gonna hit Gather Window so I can see the settings of this secondary display. There it is. I'm gonna click Scaled, and it gives me different options that I can send to that projector. My projector's native resolution is 1024 by 768. So I'm going to make sure that that's selected and quit out of here. On a PC, it's very similar. Go to control panel, then display, then screen resolution. Make sure that under multiple displays, it's set to extend and that the resolution is set correctly. Now we can do the fun stuff, which is diving into After Effects. Now, like most software, there is a learning curve to this. It's not going to be something that you can just sit down at and instantly know how to how to do things. However, it is very intuitive and very, very straightforward. And again, if you have any questions, there's tons and tons of help out there. Anything that you want to learn or anything that you want to do, you can find out uh, on YouTube or other places very, very easily. Because of that, this is going to be a very much whirlwind tutorial. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. And there's going to be many times where many of you are going to say, whoa, wait a minute, that went way too fast. Back up, go over it again. So excuse me if I, if I uh, skip over things or, uh, or go a little bit too fast. Uh, again, there's plenty of help out there. I'm going to click New Project and immediately go and file Save. If you don't save and you're in After Effects crashes, which it sometimes does, you will lose everything. Um, in my folder, in pro Project Files, I'm going to save it here. 1806 Projector Mapping VFX. Hit Enter. Similarly to Premiere, we have a project panel, which all of our assets and media, sound files, audio files, videos, images, uh, timelines, compositions, everything is, is uh, organized inside of here. We, are, we have we have our canvas, which is where we do our animating. At the bottom, we have our timeline. And then we have all of our properties panels here on the right side. There's one last setting that I need to do that enables After Effects to talk directly with the projector. Up in After Effects, go to Preferences and Video Preview. Now, if you've set up your projector correctly and set your settings to unmirrored or extended displays, it should show up here on this list. Mine shows up right here, Adobe Monitor 2 1024 by 768, so I know it's the right one. I check that and hit OK. What that does is it duplicates what's ever on the active canvas as a pixel accurate representation on the projector, which is awesome, and it's exactly what we need to get started. So I'm going to start by importing that audio file that we just made. Double click and find your file, click open. I need to add this to a timeline. In After Effects, timelines are called compositions. So I'm going to grab this asset, drag it down to the new composition icon, and there's my new composition. Um, as you can see, all these markers that I placed in Premiere are imported, which is fantastic. I can see my waveforms here by twirling down into audio and waveform. And there's my waveforms with all my markers nicely synced up. 
Just an FYI, this checkerboard pattern here means transparent or alpha, which means that we can see through it to the background. Let's set the resolution of our canvas by going up to Composition and hitting Composition Settings or Command or Control K. Uh, I'm going to set it to my native resolution of my projector, which is 1280 by, no, which is 1024 by 768 and hit Enter. I can also set my frame rate here and I'm going to do a frame rate of 30 frames a second. Hit OK and now it's time to start drawing shapes. I'm going to make a new composition and we're, we're going to call this map. And I'm going to set my dimensions to 1024 by 768 at a frame rate of 30. Hit OK. And I'm going to put in a new solid layer. Let's make the solid layer 1024 by 768 and make the color white. Now inside of this, I'm going to make a mask using the pen tool. And as I mask this, I can see that mask show up live on my projector. So I'm going to grab the corners of this and mask in the first top left window. Just like keeping files organized, it's equally as important to keep your layers organized. So I'm going to rename this top window one. Let's copy and paste this layer. And once more, window two and window three. I'm going to twirl down to this mask that we just created and shift this over. Same thing with my top window three. So I'm going to copy, well, let's make a whole new layer because then I can do a new color behind it. Let's do a light pink. And I'm going to hide my windows and make another mask on top of the window frame. And I'm making both the window and the window frame so I have more versatility when I'm animating. If there's something on your house that you think that you might use later on, it's better to just go ahead and trace it out now. So there's window one. I'm going to rename this layer top window one frame. And I'll copy, paste, paste. I can hit enter down here to rename it, rename the layer easily. And I'm again moving the mask and not the entire layer. Yes, I could just grab the entire layer and move it. But the problem with that is if I turn off my mask, see how it moved my entire layer over and not just my mask. So I'm going to reset my transform, select my mask, and just move my mask. Let's turn that back to add. And again, I'm going over a lot very, very quickly. If you have questions on any of this, just look up what is a mask, how to make masks, what these are all good things to know, and things that I just don't have time to go over. So there we go. I have all my top windows and my window frames created, and they look decent on the house. I could go in and tweak them just a little bit more. Um, I'm going to go ahead and trace out all the other parts of the house and I'll fast forward that, speed that up, and I'll see you in about an hour. All right, I've gone ahead and traced my entire house and I've made masks of all the objects and it took me, oh, just over an hour. It wasn't too bad. I made about 80 shapes. I decided to do it all in one layer with each mask labeled. So if I come up here, for example, to left door and I turn that to add, there is conveniently my left door and you can see that on the model. Just like X lights, I also chose to make larger areas. For example, the entire house. If I scroll down to the bottom, I have a whole house I turn that to add, 
we can see the entire house, which actually includes a lot of the other masks. Whole house minus the step. And I also made one that's whole house minus the sides and the step. Notice that that doesn't include the two sides. And this is just convenient because if I choose to put a video layer on there, I can easily just add that mask to the video layer and just see the video inside of that area on the house. So it's convenient to have those kind of groups. Wonderful. Well, let's start animating some stuff. There's a few animation techniques that I want to show you. The first one is just taking pre-made video layers, putting them on your house, and applying a mask to them. So let's go ahead and find something. I found a fun little animation that I found on YouTube and just downloaded that. And there's some, it's fairly low quality, but there's some stuff that I can use from this. So I'm going to click and drag that into my project panel and drag that down to my composition and find a good little section of that that I want to use. I like this little witch. So let's trim this. I'll call that good. Uh, the shortcut for trimming is alternate left bracket and right bracket. So you can either drag it or I can hit alternate right bracket and it will trim the layer to where your playhead is. Let's bring that to the beginning. And I want to put that in the bottom left window. So I can do that one of two ways. I can go and scale that and crop it and, and fit it in there or I can create a track mat and track mats are awesome. It basically uses a layer as the alpha information to know where the layer needs to be cropped and then another layer as the video information. And I'll show you how to do that. So with this master mask, I'm going to copy and paste it just so I don't destroy my main mask. Let's turn this on and find my window 2. There it is, and let's turn that to add. Now that that's on, let's go ahead and hit S for scale. And I can scale this layer and drag it and fit it roughly into this window. Notice it's slightly overlapping, but that's okay. Now, I'm going to set this top layer as the elf information and the bottom layer as the actual video information. To do that, I need to turn on this little guy down here that it says expand or collapse the transfer control span. <laughs> kind of a mouthful and it gives me an option under the track mat I'm going to select this to alpha mat and notice that it has master mask which is the layer immediately above that uh, to use as the alpha mat and that'll do a few things one is that it'll automatically hide that layer and the second thing is that it'll apply that alpha information to the layer below it which is this so if I turn this back on there's my green square and notice that now my bottom layer is cropped, the sides are cropped. Now if I turn the setting back off, you can see now it's not cropped, and it's not within the constraints of the window, and if I turn it back on, it is cropped, which is exactly what I want. So let's do one more of these for the other window. Um, I'm going to hide this layer, and let's find another little clip that's kind of cool. I like that. Alternate begin bracket. Let's move that forward and alternate end bracket. Again, I'm going to copy and paste my main master mask, drag it to right above this layer, go to add, and again set this to alpha mat. And something's funny. Oh, I haven't scaled my video in yet. Oops. Let's turn this back off and scale it in, drag it. As a side note, all of these transform controls I can easily access by hitting uh, P for position, S for scale, R for rotation, T. Uh, I think they were thinking transparency, but T means opacity. So if I just hit S, 
uh, I can easily have the uh, the scale property shows up. Same thing for P, T, um, A for anchor point, etc., etc. I can also hit P and hit Shift S, and that will give me both of these, which is great. So I often I often have my position and my scale properties show up at the same time, so I can easily come in and adjust these layers. So let's center this up, scale it down just a little bit more. And now I can hit alpha mat, and that will automatically hide the layer above it and crop it. Now when I click the layer above it, it shows all these other masks, and that's okay because they're all set to none. Only this window 3 mask is set to add. Great, let's come to the beginning and hit the spacebar to play it and take a look. And this is awesome. Basically, I can find any piece of video content from any source that I want to and crop it and fit it into any piece of the house that I want to. I can also have multiple pieces going on at different parts of the house at the same time. A friendly note, the more that you add in, the longer it's going to take to render, especially when you get up to 20, 30 layers and you hit the spacebar, After Effects no longer plays it in real time. It'll have to render it through once. And then you can go back and hit play and it'll, it'll speed it up a little bit and you can actually get a feel of what it looks like. Now, once your map is created, you can go back into your office and sit in your comfy chair and make all this content because your map is, is made. Or you can do a similar thing that you did while making your map and you can see your canvas live projected on your house and you can do all of your animation while watching it live on your house, which is kind of cool. Me, I think it's a lot more comfortable to make the map first and then come inside and make all of your content later. Great, the next effect that I want to show you is kind of a, a build effect in which we're going to animate these masks and make the, make the different shapes build on the house. So I'm going to hide these two layers, copy and paste my master mask, and I'm going to animate one mask at a time. Let's start with our pillars. Let's select our four pillars, go to add, turn my layer on, and there's my four pillars right there. Now, I'm going to introduce a principle called keyframing. Underneath, underneath each property, when you twirl down to it, there's a little stopwatch here. When you enable the stopwatch, it gives you a keyframe in the timeline. A, a keyframe basically freezes the values of that property at a specific time. So I'm going to have a keyframe at 0 seconds and another keyframe at, say, 4 seconds. Notice when I hit the watch here, it gives me these options here, which I can go forward and backward between keyframes, and also I can click the, the center diamond there and add another keyframe. So let's do that. Let's add my second keyframe, go back to my first one, select my mask, I'm going to zoom in and grab these top, whoop, grab these top two points here. I'll shift select both of them, zoom back out, and bring them down so they kind of meet this, the other two points. Now if I scrub through my timeline, I can see from the first keyframe, all four are together, and the second keyframe, the pillar is reset, which is awesome. I can now grab that keyframe and make it two seconds, or one second, hit plus and minus to zoom into the timeline, okay, and I'm going to do the same thing with my other three pillars. There we go, and in about 10 seconds I can make an animation where the pillars rise. Now I want to offset these. I'm going to hit page up and page down on my keyboard to advance frames. Let's go five frames and offset these keyframes. And that just makes it a little bit more dynamic. There we go. Hit play. Awesome. While we're looking into keyframes, I want to show one more animation technique, and that is easing. It's a lot more natural for things not to all of a sudden start and stop. Rather, they slowly accelerate into the motion and back out of the motion. So to do that, I'm going to select all my keyframes, right-click, and go to Keyframe Assistant, and select Easy Ease, or F9 on my keyboard. Notice the difference. They slowly accelerate into the motion, and when they're nearing the end, they slowly accelerate back out. 
and this is just a little bit more natural of a movement. Great, I'm going to do just a few more shapes to kind of show you this build animation that we want to create. Let's go down to our fence. Window 2 fence. These vertical pieces I named fence 1 through 7, and I have a fence top and a fence bottom. Let's go through 1 through 7. Select all of them, twirl down, set my keyframe for mask. Let's go to 1 second and set another keyframe. I'm going to zoom in and draw a box around all these top points, and I can animate them all at once. Let's click and drag them all down to the start, and select all of these keyframes and hit F9. There we go. I'm going to also set these to add. And we have a nice, very simple animation. Again, I'm going to offset these, let's say, by two frames. Hit page down. Awesome. Let's take a look. Looks great. One more shortcut key that I want to teach you is, is U. If I press U, it reveals only the properties that have keyframes. So I can easily get into and adjust all my keyframes without having to twirl down a million properties to find what I'm looking for. I can hit U again and it contracts everything. And again, hitting U will reveal all the properties that have keyframes on them, which is pretty awesome. Great. The next thing that I want to show you is how to change colors in these layers. So what I'm going to do is separate these fence layers from these pillar layers. And to do that, I'm going to copy and paste this master mask. Let's label this first one pillars. And the second one, fence. Great. Now in the pillars layer, I've already animated everything, but I'm just going to turn off the masks for the fence so we don't see them. And likewise, in the fence layer, I'm going to turn off the pillars. And let's just double check that I did that right. There's my pillars, and there's my fence. Wonderful. Now there's a bunch of different ways that I can add color to this. And here's one of them. I'm going to right click on the layer and come up to layer styles. Now if you're familiar with Photoshop, these are, these are the exact same layer styles that are in there. Let's come down to gradient overlay. And notice that that puts a nice gradient on my layer. Let's twirl down into the gradient overlay, and it gives me a bunch of options. I can click on Edit Gradient, and that gives me a nice window that I can come into and add a little bit of color to. There we go, nice and bright and happy. I'm going to do the same thing on the fence. Right click, go to Layer Styles. Color overlay, and I can set it to a solid color. Let's set it to a deep blue purple. There we go. And let's take a look. Looks great. I'm going to go ahead and fast forward a little bit and show you what I created with these very simple keyframing properties and color properties. Let's take a look. And there we go. Yeah, just some very, very simple mask moving, very simple keyframing, a little bit of the easing, and some gradients and colors. And we can make a pretty cool animation quite quickly, actually. This took only five to ten minutes. Great. The next technique that I want to show you is how to put an outline on all the architectural features of your house. To do that, I'm again going to copy my master mask, bring it down to the bottom, and let's set most all of my masks to add. Everything except for the whole house. And now I'm going to add an effect. There's two ways I can do that. I can come up to effect. And there's all of these different effects that I can add. There's some really, really powerful, awesome effects in here um, that just take some time to fiddle around with to see what they do. I also have an effects and presets panel here on the right side and I can easily search for an effect. I'm going to search for one that's called stroke. There it is. I'm going to click this and drag it down onto my layer. And in my effect controls panel, I have some more I have some more controls 
and these controls can also be accessed if I twirl down on the layer, go down to effects, down to stroke, and notice that the identical properties are down here. So in my stroke effect, I'm going to select all masks, and I want to change the paint style to reveal original image. To see them better, I'm going to toggle the background from alpha to the background color by clicking this little button here, toggle transparency grid, and that turns my background black. And as a side note, I can change that background color by coming up to composition, composition settings, and there's my background color right there. Now I want to change my stroke thickness. Let's bump that up just a little bit. We can see that looks pretty nice on my house. Now because the paint style is set to reveal original image, it's using the color from the original image. I can easily change that by right clicking, going to layer styles, and let's add a gradient overlay to it. Come down to edit gradient. change the colors a bit, and I'm going to make this into a radial gradient. Under style, click on linear and go to radial, and that makes the gradient start from the middle and expand outward. And then I'm going to scale it, I'm going to scale it up just a little bit, and that looks pretty cool. Okay, so there's a pretty cool outline of all the features on the house. Let's now take this layer. I'm going to rename it to Outline. On this layer, I'm going to add another effect called Turbulent Displace. And again, I can easily find it by just typing in the first few letters and it will do a search. It's under Distort Turbulent Displace. And you can see what that's doing already. Kind of a cool little wobbly type effect. And this effect is kind of just a cool one where it just slightly skews the outline and it makes you kind of do a double take at it. Anyways, it's an effect that I really like. I'm going to turn down the amount quite a bit to, oh, about there. And under my evolution setting, I can click this and drag it. And that kind of gives it a little wobbly type effect. Now to make that move without me clicking it, I need to add a keyframe. Let's click the stopwatch, and now that I have the stopwatch selected up here, I can select my layer. Again, hit U. That will reveal that property. And notice that it placed a keyframe right at my playhead time. Let's advance to about four seconds and increase my evolution a bit. There we go. And let's watch it back. I think that looks pretty cool. I'm going to add one more thing, and that is a keyframe on the amount. I want it to start with no displacement and gradually add a bit of displacement. Keyframe amount, click on the layer, hit U, and there's my amount. Let's add another keyframe at one second. Go back to zero seconds and start with an amount of zero. Let's see what that does. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, it's just kind of a cool little effect that you can use. All right, the next thing that I want to show you is the shatter effect. And this is kind of a cool one that you can have bricks crumble and break. To do that, I'm going to find an image of a brick wall. I already found one on Google Images. Let's grab that and drag it into my project and drag that down into my composition. I'm going to click scale and scale that back quite a bit because I want smaller bricks. I'm going to add an effect called Repetile and that will basically duplicate and extend that image out to the right, left, top, and bottom. I'm going to set the tiling pattern to unfold. That gives it a little bit more of a natural look. Now that I have my texture, I want to mask this inside of the shape of the house. We already know how to do that. I'm going to copy and paste my master mask Let's turn that on, Turn, find my mask that is the whole house, minus the sides and step. Well, let's have the sides in there as well. Add that, 
and then set this bottom layer to alpha matte. And now that image is constrained within the constraints of the house, which is exactly what I want. There's one more thing that I need to do, and that is to combine these two layers into its own composition. Now here's the power of After Effects and a feature that I think is really cool. I can make a composition and take that entire comp and put it as one layer inside of another comp. So you can layer comps. To do that, I'm going to take the bottom two layers, right click, and go to Precompose. Now that automatically will make me a new composition. Let's entitle this Shatter Bricks. Great. Notice that those two layers are automatically moved into my new composition. And back in my main composition, I have a sub-composition called Shatter Bricks. Now if I double click on this, it brings me back to that composition. All right, on this layer, I'm going to add a shatter effect. And I'm going to select rendered view. Now if I just scrub forward, we see it gives us a kind of a cool shatter effect. Let's now go and adjust some of these properties. The first one is the shape. I want the shape to be bricks. And let's adjust the repetitions just up just a little bit so they more or less follow the shape of my original pattern. Notice as I increase this, the pieces get smaller and smaller. They don't have to be exact, but yeah, that's about good. Here I can also change the extrusion depth or the thickness of the bricks. And we'll talk more about extrusions here in a minute. I think that's good. Now I want my bricks to shatter from the top down, and I can change that in the force setting. So let's move that way up to the top. I'm going to adjust my radius down just a little bit. Come way up to the top, add a keyframe. Hit U, let's bring your keyframe all the way to the beginning, and at, let's say, three seconds, I'm going to bring the center of this force all the way down. And that looks like a pretty cool effect. It's not affecting these edges, so let's add another keyframe to the radius. Click U again, and there's my two keyframes that I just set with the radius. The radius is small at the top, and as it goes down, the radius gets bigger and bigger. And let's make it even bigger right there so it gets those last few bricks. Awesome. Now in the physics twirl down, I'm going to adjust my gravity. I'm going to turn my gravity down just a little bit from 3 to 2. That'll make them fall a little bit less fast. Let's even turn it down to one. Now that looks pretty cool here on my computer, but it looks even cooler on the live projection. There's one more setting that I want to adjust, and that is the tumble randomness. and that just makes it look a little bit more dynamic and actually like it's a brick wall crumbling. And then I'm going to use YouTube to find a cool kind of crumbling rock sound effect. Let's drag that into my project window, turn off the video, and just have the audio on here. I'm going to twirl down to my waveform, and hit Alt left bracket, and drag that to the beginning. And that sounds pretty cool. I was doing a search for some cool places that I can get content, and one place that came up was this site called videomapping.store. And they basically have all these pre-made elements that you can take and drag and drop onto your house. And some of them are pretty cool looking. So you can download these, and each of these elements is a separate file, which then you can take and scale and position onto your house. So this is what my dollhouse looks like with those elements mapped onto it. 
near the end of my audio track, there's a voice that says, I'm coming for you. And I want to jump into Character Animator and, and animate a little puppet that says that. Here's what it sounds like. I'm coming for you. So let's jump into Character Animator and do that. I went ahead and rendered out just that section as a WAV file. So my goal is, is that I want to have a character speak those words. And fortunately, Adobe has a really awesome software to do that. In the Creative Cloud, and this software is included with a subscription, it's called Character Animator, and you can click right there to, to download the software. Next, I'm going to open up my projector mapping folder, and I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder completely that's called Character Animator. Next, I need to find a puppet. Online, if you go to oksamurai.com forward slash puppets, there's a few dozen free puppets here, and I'm going to find one that's kind of scary-ish. Yeah, these are all pretty happy, cute puppets. Let's settle on this little guy. Let's download him to that folder and open up Character Animator. I'm going to hit File New. And again, inside of my folder on the desktop, let's name this I'm Coming For You. Over here in my project window, I'm going to double click and import the puppet that I just downloaded. Click on the puppet and go to Scene, Add to New Scene. Now notice on the right side there's a live feed from my webcam. That's taking facial recognition and translating it into this puppet. There's one property that I want to turn off and that is head turn. So that way he's always looking right at the camera. Now notice if I move my head left and right he follows. I can go left, right, spin, up and down, make him jump a little bit. I can even make him walk left and right, which is pretty awesome. If I hit record down here, it will record all those motions and then play them back. Notice that his mouth is also following my spoken word, which is pretty cool. So basically it's creating live visings. Now I know that some of you are thinking, well, why did I just spend all this time creating a lyric track when we could just do it this way? Well, it's not really a waste of time because their audio recognition isn't that great. It's a fairly new technology. The software's only been out there for about a year or so. So doing what the x Light Singing Faces group did is definitely not a waste of time. Here's another really cool thing about this software. Just like After Effects, I can see a live duplication of this canvas over on my projector. And that's in Preferences, Live Output, Adobe Monitor 3, 1024 by 768 hit OK, and there I am live projected on my dollhouse. You can use your imagination for this for Halloween or Christmas, putting a character and having the kids come up to a webcam and come and interact and see themselves talking and walking and dancing and moving on your house, which I think is pretty awesome. Okay, next I want to import that audio track that I just created. Double click and navigate to it. I'm going to add that audio track down to the timeline. And using plus and minus, I can zoom in. Next, with the puppet and the audio selected, I'm going to come up to timeline and click compute lip sync from scene audio. It'll sit here and think for a second and basically create the visings automatically from that audio file. And notice that the visings show up down here. And it's, it's mediocre to say at best. You'll definitely need to go in and, and adjust these visings. I'm coming for you. Yeah, not quite. It's close, but I can right click on any of these visings and it gives me a number of selections. And I can also zoom in and track these visings right and left. But I'm going to adjust for a second and I'll speed this up. Okay, great. This is what I'm at so far. I'm coming for you. Not too bad. 
Now I'm going to turn my webcam back on and record a little bit of motion. Let's take my glasses off so it can actually follow my eyeballs. You can also see that it blinks when I blink. Which is pretty awesome. I'm going to hit record and record a little bit of motion. I'm coming for you. When I'm all done, I can just save and close. Coming back to After Effects, I'm going to import the puppet. And I'm not even going to render it out. I'm just going to bring in the data file, which is very, very small, <laughs> zero bytes. And this is one of the really cool things about the Adobe software is that it all talks to each other. And often you don't have to use video intermediates. You can just use data files and they'll automatically talk to each other and update dynamically. It's called Dynamic Link. I'll choose the scene that I just created, hit OK, and drag this down into a new composition. And there it is. Let's scale this down. Here's my master. And I'm going to find the mask that has just the house. And I will use that as an alpha mat for my video. And there's my dude. I'm coming for you. Not horribly scary, but it'll do the job. I can then go and sync that audio back up into my main project, and voila! The last technique that I want to show you is a really cool one. It's kind of advanced. It's one of the first times that I've used it. It uses 3D objects and lights, and you can actually get real-time shadows. And it's really, really cool, but it really pushes the bounds of what After Effects can do. Basically, my goal kind of is to make a mock 3D model of my surface. So I want to try to break down my surface depth-wise into different layers that have a common depth. And I've already gone ahead and done that. I have my roof layer, my eaves layer, which is slightly behind the roof, outlines, which include my pillars and my fence and my window frames. Behind that, I have the house. Behind that, I have the windows on the sides and then the background behind those windows. The next thing to do is position these layers in z-space and add extrusion depth to them. To do that, I'm going to change one view to two views so I can see a top and a front view. Next, select all these layers and hit P for position. Notice I have an X and Y position. I'm going to set them all to 3D layer. Now when I do that and hit position again, notice that I now have X, Y, and Z position. Also in my top view, you can now see that they're flat. Using the Z position, I'm now going to position these in Z space. My side shapes are the very, very back, with the windows slightly in front of them. And I have my main house quite a bit in front of that, and this is all again approximate, I can change this later. Outlines in front of that. Eaves in front of that. And the closest one towards me is the roof. Great. The next thing that I want to do is add extrusion depth to these. To do that, I need to change my renderer. In my composition settings, I'm going to come over to 3D Renderer and change this to Ray Trace 3D and hit OK. Ray Trace 3D enables layers to have depth to them. They're not just flat objects anymore floating in a 3D-ish space. They actually can have depth to them, which is pretty cool. Changing it to Ray Trace 3D gives me a, another option here called Geometry Options, and under that, there's Extrusion Depth. I'm going to extrude this all the way to the back layer, and do that for all of my other layers. I'm going to set this top view to Custom View 1. Let's zoom in and hit Fit. Now when you start working with 3D objects with complex extrusions, uh, After Effects really starts to bog down. So I'm going to change my preview setting to Fast Draft. And that'll just make it render a bit faster. Come up here to the Unified Camera tool, or hit C, and I can now click and drag this object in 3D space. And you can't really see it that well until we add lights to it. You can kind of see that it is a 3D object, which is kind of cool. Let's go ahead and add a new light. And then make it a Spotlight. Let's do an intensity of 90. Hit OK. And you can already start to see how cool that looks on the live projection. 
Let's move it around a little bit to kind of give you an idea of how awesome this is. Making shadows that aren't really there. And you can use your imagination of all the cool things that you can do with this. Again, a word of warning, if you do choose to do some kind of 3D lighting technique like this, it does take a very long time to render. I'm going to add some keyframes to this. Now with a the light, there's two keyframes that I need to worry about. One is the point of origin, which is where it's pointing, and the other is the actual X, Y, and Z dimensions. So let's troll down and enable my stopwatch on point of interest and position. Come to four seconds and add two more keyframes. Let's X to the right and Y down and also change my point of origin to over here. Let's give it a look. That looks pretty darn cool. Now if I set this back to adaptive resolution or final quality, it will take a very, very long time to render. Uh, 20 seconds, anywhere from 20 seconds to 3 minutes a frame. So when you're actually exporting this, you might want to do it overnight. Okay, coming back to my main composition, the last thing that I want to show you how to do is export the video. I'm just going to export this falling brick effect that we made earlier. I want to set in and out points on my timeline, so it's not rendering the full 50 seconds. I can either grab this right handle and bring it into 4 seconds, or I can come up to my composition settings and set the duration to 5 seconds. Now to export this, I'm going to come up to Composition and go down to Add to Render Queue. That will then add that main composition into the Render Queue window. And this is where I can set all my output settings and my file path. I want my format to be QuickTime. And under Format Options, I'm going to set my video co codec to H.264 and hit OK, and OK again. And then to set my render path, I can click on Output to. I'm going to output it to the desktop under Projector Mapping in my Renders folder. And let's call this Halloween version 1. Hit Save and click Render. This will then create a single file that I can then take and play back later. All right, after all is said and done, this is what I was able to come up with. This is maybe a day, day and a half worth of work. Awesome. Well, that's the end of the pre-recorded presentation. I'm going to jump back into my slide deck. Hopefully you guys thought that that was kind of cool. There was some, uh, I thought, some pretty cool stuff in there. I love the word cool, by the way. And one of them is gathering content. There's tons of places that we can go to gather content, including YouTube and uh, VidEasy, VideoBlocks, VideoHive, Pond5, etc., etc. I'm going to go through just a few of these. Ryan had a fantastic uh, little couple of tidbits uh, that he gave on his X-Lights presentation. It was uploaded on May 17th of 2018 of how to find and use YouTube content. So I'd recommend watching Ryan's tutorial. Here's what VidEasy's library looks like. This is uh, Storyblocks by Videoblocks, videoblocks.com. They have some pretty great content and they also have a free trial and their free trial when I did it a few years back, it lets you download, I think, 10 or slow clips for free a day for a week and then make sure that you cancel your subscription after a week and then they won't charge you. There's Envato Market, which is videohive.net. They have a bunch of fun stuff, including After Effects templates. I mean, these aren't, this isn't just footage, background footage and live action footage, uh, but there's also a bunch of After Effects templates, which are 
a great way to learn to download and dig into, load them up and pick apart the layers and the effects and stuff. There's Pond5, of course, it's a little bit pricier. And then the good old Atmos effects. Don't we all love Atmos? They have some great stuff, some really, really cool stuff. It's fun, but everyone's using it, so yeah. Uh, the Singing Pupkin, this is a guy that, again, lives down the street from me that made all these fun singing faces, and you can, now that you know how to map, you can take these faces and actually position them onto your projection surface if you have pumpkins. Similar with a snowman, he has singing faces for a snowman. So kind of some fun stuff there. Uh, Lightrageous.com, dot dot com apparently, has some uh, fun stuff. Next, let's talk about playback. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to play this back. If you don't have a super fancy uh, media server like a D3 or Hippo or some other thing or some other software, and somebody made a comment a minute ago about looking for software at projection-mapping.org slash software, I looked at that. There's some fantastic stuff there. It's basically everything middle to very, very high-end software uh, and media servers in there. So give that a look. Uh, for us, it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to run it off Falcon Pi Player or Xschedule. Uh, tutorials on Falcon Pi Player can be found at falconchristmas.com, Xschedule. There's some out there that Keith does. You'll have to look around to find them, though. Next thing I want to talk about going further. What's, what's next after this, after you've made all this great content? Um, July 20th at the Expo, there's conveniently a two-hour class split into two one-hour parts, and it's entitled Intro to Projector Mapping. I have no idea who's teaching it, but I wish that I could go, and if I was going, I would love to take that class and learn some of these things again and review some of these things again. Again, this is just like x lights and like any other thing that we do in life, basically. There's more than one, ways, more than one way to do it. Um, this method that I showed you using After Effects is one of many, many ways. Who's ever presenting at the Christmas Expo might be using a completely different way, which is great. You know, the more we can learn about this stuff, the better. Mapping tutorials, here's some mapping tutorials. I'll po post these links in the, in the YouTube video. And software, I'll also add the link on there to the uh, projector-mapping.org. After Effects tutorials. After Effects is awesome because anything that you wanna learn, you can find online. You can, of course, use YouTube. There's tons of tutorials out there. Just ask YouTube what you want to learn and you'll find a dozen different tutorials on how to do it. Videocopilot.net is a fantastic place. That's medium to advanced tutorials. It gets into really deep into effects, but they're really they're really interesting to, to listen to, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Kramer does a great job over there. And then there's a few other ones listed here. Okay, last things last, and I have to give a plug for the X-Lights Around the World video. This year, uh, by popular Consent, I guess, we did a poll and we're going to do the song The Greatest Show from The Greatest Showman. That's the opening song. Um, for it, if you were participated in it last year, uh, you film a video of your house and then we put it together and make a video where every few seconds we switch to a new house and basically show the same song, not necessarily the same sequence, but the same song from different houses all around the world. If you want to be a part of that, which I'd highly recommend, uh, an epic sequence will be provided. Uh, I think by Ryan, and it will be provided sometime in, in September, October. That's kind of what we're aiming for. You can use this sequence or create your own sequence from scratch, and then film your display and submit it, and we'll have, uh, again, more information about that. Submit it by mid-December. We're moving up the due date a little bit so we can get the video done and, uh, and, uh, and thrown out on social media before Christmas, so that's the goal. Uh, the due, due date will likely be December 16th. Well, I hope you guys learned something. I had a blast putting this together. Again, it was a whirlwind of information. Best of luck. <laughs> I mean, this is this is fun stuff. Once you dive into it, I, I guarantee you will have a, a blast doing it. All right. Thanks, guys. The X-Lights Project exists because of people like you. Help contribute to the project by making a donation today at xlights.org slash donate.